More Brains to the Square Inch from Lawyers in Turmoil, the Johannesburg Conspiracy of 1895 by Owen Rogers. This book is newly published and can be ordered via the bookstore at caperebel.com or by emailing admin at caperebel.com for an invoice. When Leander Starr Jamison and his column entered the South African Republic from the Bechuanaland Protectorate on the night of Sunday, the 29th of December, 1895, lawyers were bound to be caught up in the ensuing drama. And so they were. In the dock, at the bar, on the bench, behind the scenes, and, in one instance, beyond reach. Several features strike the modern student of this period in the Transvaal's history. Given the times, it is unsurprising that the actors were white men, though there is irony nonetheless in the way leading liberal men spoke of the fraught race relations between the Dutch and the English population, and of the right to equality, without any thought that similar sentiments might apply to the black majority. What is striking is that it was a young man's world. At the time of the Jamison raid, many of the lawyers who feature in the story were in their thirties or late twenties, the rest mainly in their early forties. The same is true of the leading capitalists. Of the four Johannesburg ringleaders, George Farrer was 36, while Lionel Phillips and John Hammond were 40. And in Cape Town, the eminence Greece, Cecil John Rhodes, Prime Minister of the Colony and Controller of Consolidated Goldfields and of the Chartered Company, was just 42. Fred Hamilton, editor of the Eight London mouthpiece, The Star, was 30. But the men drawn to the Witwatersrand in the heady days following the discovery of the Gold Reef in 1886 were not only young, they were extraordinarily able. James Leonard, a leading Transvaal advocate and a character in our drama, modestly observed of Johannesburg in the 1890s that the Rand contained more brains to the square inch than any other place on earth. A glittering array of legal talent, including three future Chief Justices of the Union, was on display in Pretoria's Market Hall for the trial of the Johannesburg Conspirators in April 1896. Another striking feature is the active involvement of lawyers, including judges, in politics to an extent which is nowadays unusual, if not frowned upon. The involvement of lawyers in revolutionary movements is not unique to the Jamison Raid. There are several reasons for this. Oppressive regimes achieve their aims through unjust laws. Revolutions seek to sweep those laws away and replace them with better ones. Before matters reach that point, lawyers defend those charged with contravening oppressive laws. Practitioners who have undergone a rounded legal education can easily identify the ways in which a prevailing legal system falls short. Their knowledge of the law and skill in formulating argument are important tools in building the case against the unjust regime 
and winning popular support. And after a successful revolution, lawyers are needed to lay the groundwork for a new system of government. It is thus unsurprising that the lawyers on the Rand in 1895 could have found precedents in Thomas Jefferson and John Adams in America, and Maximilian Robespierre, George Danton, and Camille Desmoulins in France. About 22 years later, the lawyer Alexander Kerensky was in the van of the Russian Revolution before being forced into exile after a few months in the Bolshevik takeover, led by another revolutionary lawyer, Vladimir Lenin. And in South Africa, lawyers were to feature prominently in the struggle against apartheid. Apart from Nelson Mandela, Ravonia treason trialists included the lawyers Duma Nokwe and Joe Slobo. Another lawyer, Oliver Tambo, was in exile. Famous names featured for the defence Izzy Meisels, Sidney Kentridge, and Bram Fisher, among others. In its own way, and on a much smaller scale, the botched Johannesburg Revolution, which was meant to have been bolstered by Jamison's incursion, was also a struggle for racial equality, but one which ignored entirely the black population, which became the subject of a later liberation movement. On the Rand in 1895, the racial struggle was between the Dutch burghers and the newcomers, the so-called Uitlanders, or outsiders. Although the latter included people of many nationalities, they were predominantly English-speaking Britons, hailing from their motherland or its colonies, particularly the Cape, Natal, and Australia. When, at this time, people in South Africa, which did not yet exist as a political entity, spoke of racial harmony or racial strife, they were talking about relations between the Dutch-speaking and English-speaking populations of the country. Although the Jamison Raid had its farcical side, its importance in South African history should not be underestimated. Until 1896, progressive Boers were gaining ground in the ZAR. This trend was shattered by the raid. The Dutch and English at once became highly polarised, not only in the Transvaal, but in the rest of South Africa too. The Kruger government, having received a wake-up call, stepped up its program of rearmament. The hawkish colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, whose role will not receive attention in this book, but who undoubtedly had foreknowledge of the plot, smarted at the bungle and the embarrassment it occasioned the British government. A casus belli, real or imagined, was never far from his thoughts, though he played a cautious hand in the years between the raid and the hostilities which began in October 1899. The Boer War may have happened anyway, but the Jamison Raid made it inevitable. This was certainly true for one lawyer-turned-politician, Jan Christian Smuts, who said, with reference to that awful conflict, that the Jamison Raid was, despite the uneasy three-year truce which followed it, the real declaration of war. Manfred Nathan, a newspaper reporter at the time of the raid, but later an advocate in the Transvaal, said of that three-year period, 
We lived in an atmosphere charged with electricity, or as some phrased it, on the brink of a volcano. Everybody knew war was in the offing, though nobody could predict with accuracy when it would break out. Sir Henry de Villiers, then Chief Justice in the Cape Colony, wrote to his counterpart in the Transvaal in May 1896 that the whole plot of the raid read like a farce. Were it not for the serious consequences to South Africa, and in a letter of January 1897 to the same correspondent, he declared that Rhodes's orchestrating of the Jamison raid was an act of such transcendent wickedness as to outweigh all the good he may have done in the past. James Rose Innes, writing to an acquaintance in April 1896, described the raid as the most lamentable thing to have occurred in South Africa during his lifetime. The raid has brought us to the verge of civil war. It has greatly weakened British prestige and British influence. It has damaged the cause of the Eightlanders incalculably, and it has generally put back the clock for many years. A few months later, in a letter to John X. Merriman, Innes said that since January 1896, he had held gloomy views as to what is going to happen in South Africa in general, and in this colony especially. He had had the opportunity to gauge the intense race feeling which exists. There will be a blow-up one of these days, and the effects will not be confined to Johannesburg. In a May 1897 letter, he wrote that he had never known racial feeling to be so intense, particularly once the Dutch population realised that Rhodes was really the head and front of the Transvaal business. In the meantime, Kruger was placing increasingly oppressive legislation on the statute book. The Transvaal is now armed to an almost incredible extent, and it is beyond doubt that there is a war party in that country too. Men who say that England will attack them sooner or later, and that they had better have it out now. In his address in 1916, at the unveiling in Parliament of the bust of W.P. Schreiner, whose political relationship with Rhodes was severed at one stroke by Jamison's incursion, Innes remarked that the raid had been a stunning blow to many who had been toiling towards the realisation of a united South Africa and who saw the walls of the Temple of Union so slowly and so carefully raised come crashing to the ground. The passing of the years did not change Innes' assessment. In his autobiography, looking back on these events after several decades, he observed that the decisive battles of the world had not always been the most spectacular. The conflicts which had most decisively influenced South Africa's history were not, in his view, the Great Track or the long struggle of the Boer War, but the battles of Majuba and Duankop, the latter being the skirmish leading to Jamison's surrender. On each occasion, fewer than 8,000 men were involved. Yet the consequences of those engagements are with us still. The feelings which they roused strongly influenced the course of events during the years which followed, and they complicate and embitter the problems of today. 
For the present, it is sufficient to say that Dornkop was an engagement whose significance in South African history is out of all proportion to its military importance. William Bell, one of the Jamison lawyers we shall encounter, thought that Kruger's position in 1895 was unenviable and that he probably would soon have fallen had the Jamison raid not come to his assistance in the nick of time. That episode completely rehabilitated the aging president. The war Innes foresaw in 1897 came, bringing misery and death to countless South Africans, black and white, and to many soldiers from Britain and her colonies over the period October 1899 to March 1902. 